So, once again, welcome to everybody on our Legally Speaking Data Protection Update webinar today. It's Robert Bond, uh, and I'm joined by uh, Emma, and I'm joined by Alex, and as per normal, Jaina is on the technology. Um, we've got one of our general sort of updates today, um, but uh, if I can just take you through the usual admin. I think you know who we are. The only thing I was going to mention is we've slightly increased uh, in size. We're 140 lawyers now with some new additions. Uh, and as you know, we do a lot with data protection. I'm one of the partners in the privacy group here. And I think most of you know me. I've been doing this stuff for years, so I don't propose to say more. Uh, but uh, I'm joined by Alex Detell, who's done a lot of our webinars in the past. Uh, Alex is um, dual qualified in the sense of being qualified as an English solicitor, but also uh, non-practicing in Ireland, uh, and has done a lot of his SIP privacy exams and comes to us uh, a few years ago from some great in-house experience. And we're also joined by Emma McAllister-Hall, uh, who is again in our privacy team. Uh, and Emma trained with us and then came into our team and, like all of us, is project managing uh, a lot of international data compliance topics uh, for clients. And talking about topics, uh, we're going to do um, a whole load of different things today that we hope will be of interest. Uh, those of you who may have been on our webinars in the last few months will know I did talk a little while ago about um, how to legitimately use legitimate interests under GDPR as opposed to consent or contract. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about some official guidance that's now been published in the UK. Emma's going to talk about managing children's personal data under GDPR. Uh, then I'm going to talk about a couple of interesting publications that have come out or reports that have come out in the last two weeks. Uh, one on data management and governance from the British Academy and the Royal Society, which has some interesting uh, takeaways around not just the law but also an ethical approach to privacy compliance, and then also a report on the use of mobile data for societal good uh, from uh, the United Nations and the GSMA. Then Alex is going to look at the consultation draft that is currently out for changes to the Spanish data protection law, uh, where they are looking to implement GDPR uh, well in advance of 25th May. And then Alex, sorry, Emma is going to do the update on CCTV and uh, SARS. Um, and then I'm going to just quickly finish by looking at a recent fine from the UK Information Commissioner uh, and how that impacts on the lack of information security and what the consequences of that are when there is a cyber attack or a breach. A couple of admin issues before I move on. We're not doing polling questions today. But of course, if you've got any questions, please use the question box to send those in. And we will take those uh, as appropriate at the time or park them until the end of the presentation. The presentation itself, as you know, will be recorded. And it and a PDF of the PowerPoint will be available for download from our website uh, during next week. So let's look at guidance on legitimate interests uh, under GDPR. A lot of this is actually applicable to data protection under the current laws in Europe. Um, in that the six lawful, or as I often joke, awful grounds for processing uh, are as applicable today as they will be under GDPR, namely that you can process personal data if you have consent, although under GDPR, as we know, the consent will have to be more explicit uh, and more opt-in and less opt-out. Uh, 
but of course you can process personal data if it is as a result of a contractual requirement because of the terms on which you engage with a customer or it may be that it's uh, necessary because of a legal or administrative obligation that you as the data controller have to comply with and that might be say anti-bribery or anti-money laundering background checks and so on or it may be that you need to process personal data to protect the vital interests of the data subject and in certain circumstances where consent is simply impractical and then for those controllers who are public authorities, municipal authorities and the like uh, there may be public task requirements that legitimize processing personal data but then last on the list is legitimate interests of the data controller and as I put on this uh, slide here the mere fact that legitimate interests is last on the list uh, doesn't mean it's the least important there is no hierarchy of grounds for lawful processing but each of those six grounds do carry different legal duties and obviously we know that you're going to have to be under GDPR considerably more transparent about the way in which you are processing individuals personal data and you're going to have to break up your privacy notice into sections which describe the types of data and the lawful ground that applies to the processing that you are attaching to that data but we happen to think that there are a lot of advantages in utilizing legitimate interest um, not least that if you're processing data with a legitimate interest ground certain subject rights like data portability or the right of erasure or the right to be forgotten do not necessarily apply when the data is being processed on legitimate interest basis so let's just take a look as to what GDPR specifically says and here's by way of reminder that it is a ground under the current directive um, but under article 6 and indeed recital 47 of GDPR you can see specifically that it says you can process using legitimate interests uh, of the controller or indeed a third party that may also be relying on the data unless of course the legitimate interest overrides the rights uh, of the individual uh, recital 47 uh, also describes the same principle and we can draw out from that on the next slide several key words and when you rely on legitimate interest you you need to you need to satisfy yourself that what you're doing is necessary that it's necessary for the purposes for which you've determined you have a legitimate ground uh, that your interests mustn't outweigh the interest of the data subject or indeed their rights and freedoms and that leads us to then realize that we need to carry out what some of the regulators call a balancing test in order to on the one hand balance what you say is your legitimate right against on the other hand what is the uh, right uh, of the data subject at the bottom of this slide I've just put in the logo of the data protection network and you will have heard me talk about this on the previous occasion I talked about legitimate interests when I was saying that back in April of this year uh, the data protection network in the UK which is made up of cross-industry in-house and compliance uh, specialists in a range of businesses and not-for-profits uh, started a working group which I've been chairing uh, to see if we could help ourselves as business uh, 
to have a clearer understanding as to how to do the balancing test and how to make legitimate interests legitimate in anticipation of GDPR. And we eventually shared uh, in uh, late April uh, with the Information Commissioner in the UK and the Irish Commissioner and subsequently uh, the uh, Assistant Commissioner in Singapore our working draft. We received complementary feedback from all three of those regulators and as a result of around 53 or 56 comments and markups from the ICO's team, we then further revised what we developed and then we uh, published uh, the guidance about 10 days ago and again have received some rather pleasant compliments from the regulators uh, to what we have put out there. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit more about it in a second but just uh, at this point I will say if any of you would like uh, to gain access to the guidance in its version 1 form, uh, send me uh, or uh, to Bristow's an email uh, and we can send you a link where you can download the guidance. Um, it's version 1 and we're very much hoping that other members of industry will want to work with us uh, to get version 2 out uh, perhaps in September. Uh, and what we're looking for is case studies or examples from industry as to where legitimate interest is a logical uh, purpose to rely on for processing. So moving on, um, we mustn't forget that the rights of the individuals are these items that we have put up there. But those rights of the individuals apply primarily when the subject has consented to data processing or the data processing is as a result of a contractual uh, requirement. And as I said earlier, some of these rights do not apply if you can show that the reason that you're processing is based on a legitimate, legitimate interest. Now GDPR is really helpful because in recitals 47 to 50 they specifically say this, uh, that it's permissible to do direct marketing in reliance of a legitimate interest if there's already a connection between you and the data subject. Um, cold direct marketing can't be done uh, on legitimate interest but for example if you've already got permission to do certain uh, marketing to a consumer uh, with their permission then that might lead you to be able to do certain other added value direct marketing not necessarily with their consent but because you can show if pushed that you carried out a balancing test or what we now call a legitimate interests assessment uh, to show that what you're doing has no detrimental impact on the individual. Again, you could rely on the reasonable expectations of the party that you can show that it would not be unusual for an individual to assume that because they put their personal data into the public domain it might be acceptable to be collecting it, for example, to build profiles or to do background checks or create business intelligence. It could be that it's strictly necessary for fraud prevention for you to use certain cookies and tracking technology and to collect other data, again, where consent is neither practical uh, nor possible. It may be that it's legitimate to process data without permission if it's part of an organizational issue including perhaps a pre or due diligence prior to a merger or an acquisition or a joint venture etc where it simply is not practical nor appropriate to be seeking consent of employees for example to the fact that you might be sharing their uh, 
pay grades and so on uh, as part of a due diligence process. Or finally, that network and information security is in itself a legitimate interest. So that was a great starting point and what we then went and did uh, with the data protection network guidance was to come up between ourselves in our different industry sectors with examples where we felt that it was a legitimate interest uh, to be doing certain types of processing of data in the travel industry or in the um, non-governmental sector or in the publishing or in the legal or in the business intelligence and we built about 25 examples of legitimate interest opportunities into the guidance. We've also developed a flowchart to help you work out can we rely on legitimate interest or must we go down the consent route or the contract route and if we can rely on legitimate interest then what are the steps that we logically take and how do we um, log those steps so that we have an, an appropriate audit trail should a regulator or indeed an individual uh, want to understand the outcome that we reached and we've used that audit trail or we call that audit trail uh, a legitimate interests assessment form um, a bit akin to a data protection impact assessment. Just wanted to finish off to say um, just as we began to think that we were being innovative in the way that we were creating this guidance uh, on a self-help basis for industry uh, I was contacted within the last four days by uh, the Information Accountability Foundation, which many of you will be aware of in Canada and uh, the States, where it so happens that they have entirely independently been doing exactly the same work stream, probably a slightly more academic deep dive into legitimate interests, but nonetheless they also have produced a legitimate interest assessment form, which sort of drifts more into other risk assessment uh, within the terms of GDPR, but nonetheless I think it's, it's great. Uh, they have run uh, in between the 6th, I think, and the 11th of July, they ran their first version past the German, the Belgians, the UK, and one other regulator over here in Europe. And so I'm due to be having a call uh, with Marty Abrams from uh, the foundation in the next week or so to see how we can join forces to make something really useful for data controllers and indeed data processors at a time when, as we all know, we still have no guidance on what is consent under GDPR. We understand that it'll be September before we get something coming out from the Article 29 Working Party and legitimate interest does not appear to be on any regulator's um, radar right now and time is ticking. So I thought it would be an ideal opportunity to update where we had got to in terms of our legitimate interest guidance. And as I say, please by all means email me or through the Bristow's uh, email address which you will get after the webinar has closed. Uh, and I'll be happy to send you a link to both the DPN guidance and also the uh, drafts that are publicly available now from the Information Accountability Foundation. So with that now, I'll hand over to Emma for children's data. Thank you, Robert. Um, so going to the first slide that we've got up here. Um, the GDPR contains new provisions which are intended to enhance the protection of children's personal data, particularly in relation to consent, where children are using online services and in relation to providing notice to children about how their personal data will be used. Um, um, so the current data protection directive does not expressly address the privacy of children. 
non-binding non -binding guidance has developed, usually at a national level, which sets out standards for the collection of data from children. For instance, in the UK, the ICO has indicated that parental consent would normally be required before collecting personal data from children under the age of 12. So what does the GDPR say? Well, it's got this fundamental principle, which is on the slide, that is, that children merit specific protection with regard to their pers personal data, as they may be less aware of the risks, consequences, and safeguards concerned, and their rights in relation to the processing of personal data. And that's from Recital 38. So crucially, the GDPR states that the use of child data in marketing or for profiling purposes is an area of key concern. Profiling and automated decision making should not be applied to children's personal data for this reason. So what does the GDPR say about how you should process children's personal data? On this slide I've put down four key issues which are designed, which the GDPR has introduced to offer protection and it's summarised in these four points. So I'll just run through them quickly. The first one, crucially, is consent for online services offered to children. So under the GDPR, if an organisation offers online services to children, in the legislation this is defined as information society services, and these are offered to children under 16, and consent is the legal basis on which the data controller is relying, then a parent or guardian's consent will be required in order to process the child's personal data lawfully. And this is from Article 8. Now, online services is a huge category and would include most internet services provided at the user's request. So the GDPR sets out that parent or guardian's consent will be required where the, children is, where the child is under 16 and consent is the legal basis. Member states will, however, have the ability to lower this age to 13. And this is what we expect to happen in the UK. And note that 13 is also the age of consent set by, set by COPPA in the US. Unfortunately, it's not clear from the legisl legislation, legislation on face value whether this consent requirement will apply if the child or teenager's personal data is unintentionally collected online. The guidance from the ICO suggests that there must be an actual targeting of the child. For instance, it says the service must target online services at children. Hopefully there'll be more clarification on this point before the implementation of GDPR. So the data controller will be required to make reasonable efforts taking into account the available technology to verify the consent provided by the individual who is an who is a parent or guardian of the child. It is important to note that this rule relating to consent only affects online services. Offline data will continue to remain subject to the usual rules on the, on the capacity of children to consent. It is also important to note here that the GDPR does not provide specific rules regarding child data collected from parents and or process under a basis other than consent. For instance, the other legal bases are performance of a contract, compliance with a legal obligation or legitimate interests. So the second point, which I think is important to mention, is the requirement to provide child appropriate privacy notices. The requirement to be transparent with, indivi with individuals about how their personal data is processed is set out in Article 12 of the GDPR. This article specifically states the principle of transparency means children must be able to understand the information which is provided to them about how their information is used. And this obligation applies wherever notice is being provided, not just online or when digital services are being directly offered to children. The GDPR does not specify the ways in which data controllers may achieve this notice requirement. Instead, it states privacy notices must be written in a clear, plain way that a child will understand. What, will, what is understood by a child will clearly vary depending on the child's age. And therefore, at this stage, it appears data controllers will need to take account of the level of comprehension of the age groups involved and tailor their notices accordingly. So coming on to the third point, which is legitimate interests. 
as Robert has already explained, the legitimate interests of the controller can be a basis for processing personal data, except where such interests are overridden by the interests or fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject. Now, the GDPR states this is particularly important where the individual concerned is a child. This would suggest that if you are relying on legitimate interests or seeking to rely on legitimate interests in relation to processing children's personal data, it would be advisable to make sure the process for determining this is clearly documented and explains how you have balanced your legitimate interests against the interests of the children whose information is being processed. And finally, the right to erasure, or as it is otherwise known, the right to, um, the right to be forgotten. So the GDPR provides individuals with the right to have personal data about them erased or restricted in, certain, restricted in certain circumstances. One of these circumstances is where the personal data is processed in relation to online services being offered directly to a child. So this is the same category of information for which consent from a parent or guardian will be required if the child is younger than 16. The right to erasure based on this ground is particularly strong as individuals are able to exercise the right notwithstanding the fact that they are no longer a child and this provision seems to have been driven by a concern about data subjects giving their consent as a child for their data to be processed when they're not fully aware of the risks involved and then later regretting this decision and not being able to remove the personal data especially in relation to the internet. So the next slide is just a few suggestions of how to manage these obligations in practice. The first recommendation, perhaps helpfully, is to keep an eye out for further guidance and codes of practice. As will be clear, as was clear from the points on the first slide, the obligations relating to consent and providing appropriate privacy notices will be difficult to implement and determine without further guidance from the regulators. The ICO has stated that it is working on this issue and will aim to publish output later in 2017. Associations or other bodies representing categories of controllers or processors are also expected to prepare codes of conduct explaining in more detail how consent of parents or guardians can be obtained. Again, also member states are likely to have their own national derogations in relation to children's personal data. So while we wait for, await further guidance, the slide contains some very basic steps which businesses believe, who believe they will be affected by the GDPR rules relating to children could consider um, carrying out at this stage. And in the main, these are assessment points and just having an idea of what information you are processing and how you might start to adapt to the GDPR's um, changes. And the final point I just wanted to mention, which is not specifically related to data protection, but is again it's set in the context of providing online services to children, is that on the 27th of April this year, the um, CAP guide published guidance to the advertising world on how to ensure children under the age of 12 understand the nature of online marketing communications. So this guidance states that younger children need assistance in recognizing online marketing and require what is known as enhanced disclosure. And enhanced disclosure is essentially making the information very prominent and interpretive and sufficient to identify the marketer and the commercial content. So this is just to set in a wider context that the way in which children's information is used and the way marketing is presented to them will continue to be a subject of much debate. Thank you very much, Emma. Just to let folks know that on the webinar we've had a couple of questions in, uh, but I'm going to put them at the end. We've had one relating to direct marketing and the legitimate interest possibility, and there's one just come in um, for you, Emma, but I will give it to you at the end. What I'm going to do now is uh, move on to the next section, and I was just going to let you know about um, this report that's come out from the British Academy and the Royal Society, it's very UK focused, but um, I've been aware of the work that is being done here um, through liaison that these two organizations have had with Tech UK, uh, the body that represents the technology sector uh, in the UK. And whilst it's a very uh, academic approach. I think it has some useful takeaways uh, 
uh, around not just how we apply the law to managing privacy rights, but how we take an ethical or a moral approach. Uh, and we'll also see that the uh, report suggests some thoughts around stewardship uh, and governance uh, beyond a regulator. And here I've extracted some of the introductory statements from the report. Uh, interesting, they talk about data governance should promote human flourishing. Um, a new phrase to me, but there it is. Uh, and then go on to talk about well-being, the need for individuals to thrive, etc. But I thought that the four uh, principles that they talk about were interesting to just flag here that where you are responsible for data management or governance it's about protecting individuals and their rights it's about ensuring that the trade-off between what business wants to do or government needs to do on the one hand uh, should be a fair and equal um, exchange uh, in terms of what happens to individuals in relation to that bargain. Um, it also suggests that we should learn from good practices as well from failures uh, and that good governance um, should be there to enhance existing democratic governance. The next item in the report was some fundamental requirements for the governance, governance landscape, namely an A and a B and a C, anticipating uh, risk, so not dissimilar in a way to data protection impact assessments or privacy by design or security by default, B, building practices and setting standards, again not dissimilar to the accountability and governance requirements of say GDPR uh, and then see the notion of clarity enforcement and remedy again the notion of accountability uh, and liability for the players uh, within the whole uh, data use ecosystem and then the last bit of the report, and I am talking about a 96-page report, so I'm really praising an awful lot here, um, is they set out the core characteristics of what they call the new stewardship body. Uh, they're calling, and it's a debate as to whether it's necessary, but they're calling for an appropriate stewardship body that goes beyond the information commissioner or goes beyond the court systems or mediation or uh, non-governmentals and are essentially saying we believe and this is a very UK focus that there needs to be somebody that is independent from industry academia government etc uh, that is deeply connected to diverse communities uh, expert across a full range of disciplines that would be needed, tightly coupled to the decision-making process in terms of working with, informing, debating with politicians and legislative drafts person. Um, flexible, durable, uh, visible, uh, and nationally focused but globally relevant. Now, quite where the UK will take this, I don't know, it is literally hot off the press within the last couple of weeks, but in the 96 pages, should you be responsible for risk management, for compliance, for ethics within your organisation, it may be a good read just to see if there are some additional principles that you can draw out from that uh, to embed into your codes of practice, your codes of conduct and so on. And again, uh, if anybody's interested in the report um, and can't Google it, let me know and I can scan you a copy. 
And then sort of hot on the uh, tails of that report from the British Academy and the Royal Society, uh, we then get um, the State of Mobile Data for Social Good report uh, from the United Nations and GSMA uh, for the telecoms and the mobile sector. Um, this, again, is about a 48-page report um, which examines the successes and challenges in using mobile data for social good and lays down some, again, governance uh, and ethical issues that should be considered. So, um, since I sit on the privacy advisory group to the UN for this project, um, I can tell you that for the past two or three years, the UN Global Pulse that jointly did this report with GSMA have been carrying out certain activities without uh, the consent of data subjects but within a strict environment where they have tried to balance the rights of the individual against the humanitarian or societal outcome of the analytics. So the first example is uh, for the last two years uh, using location data from mobile phones to identify where Syrian migrants are moving to in terms of which border uh, outside of Syria in order to anticipate where do we need the food and where do we need the tents and you can see a massive humanitarian good from that type of activity but we've been very conscious that the last thing you would want would be to collect all this data without individuals consent and then only lose it to the very regime that those people are seeking to leave. By the same token, there's been some good examples of similar practices using location data and uh, ATM card data to work out again in an area of a natural disaster, an earthquake, a tsunami, etc. Where are people going and using their ATM in order to get money for emergency supplies as they exit the disaster zone? Again, to enable the UN to work out where they need to bring the uh, humanitarian relief. So this report drills into two or three further recent examples of why it works, but also talks about the way in which the uh, use of the data has been within strict um, control in terms of privacy impact assessments. Uh, to understand and demonstrate that the rights of the individual are protected and in a sense it's almost like a legitimate interests balancing test again to say can we be sure that what we do just because the technology enables us to is what we should do and where we think there are risks how do we uh, quarantine or put in place checks and balances to manage the risks so again it's not particularly a business focusing report, but there's an awful lot in it that I think from an ethics point of view and a governance point of view has some good uh, thought processes that maybe you might want to take away. And again, I, I'm sitting with a 48 page copy of it by my side, which if anybody wants to email me, uh, as I've said again. And with that, I will now move on to the Spanish law, Alex. Thank you, Robert. So Spain is bravely looking in in the in the GDPR's eye, as we can see on the picture, and it has released a draft implementing law. So with this, Spain has joined the ranks of uh, Ireland, Germany, and the Netherlands, which are countries which have also uh, started working on local laws implementing the GDPR. However, GDPR is a regulation and as such it does not really need any local implementation. Uh, the current data protection law is based on a directive which has been implemented across the EU uh, by a diverse range of local laws and uh, this has created certain uh, uh, variety and uncertainty uh, in the regulatory landscape across the EU. And the GDPR was trying to address this by uh, being a regulation and uh, having direct application in each member state. Uh, 
So the GDPR does still allow for derogations. So these are areas where member states should uh, uh, legislate uh, their own rules. However, uh, there should be no other uh, legislative initiatives within countries. Uh, perhaps the only other legislative initiatives would be relating to certain effects of the GDPR, such as uh, the need to legislate for official authority uh, to be given to public authorities so that they carry on processing data uh, which they have processed under legitimate interest uh, previously because as we know under GDPR they will no longer be able to rely on legitimate interest. Uh, but as I said the legislative uh, uh, campaign should really be focused on the derogations and any, any of these uh, uh, legislative requirements. Uh, however, instead, we see a range of comprehensive data protection laws uh, being prepared at local level, uh, or also laws that cover issues which uh, perhaps were not envisaged by the GDPR as a derogation. Uh, for example, the UK uh, has passed the Digital Economy Act, which uh, has given the ICO power to charge fees, whereas we thought that the GDPR removed any registration authorization requirements and uh, any fees uh, associated with it. Uh, so the big question remains really whether GDPR uh, really intended to have comprehensive local law sitting alongside it or if it was supposed to be the one legal source uh, that any business would turn to for uh, certainty about data protection laws in, in Europe. So looking at the Spanish draft so this is very comprehensive and it uh, does contain some surprising uh, solutions or proposals. For example, it uh, legislates that uh, where consent is relied on, uh, consent needs to be obtained for each purpose of processing. Now this is something that's, that can be probably implied from the text of the GDPR, but uh, the Spanish draft decided to make it an explicit requirement. and. Uh, uh, off the back of this, uh, one then goes into difficulties as to how this should be practically applied. For example, will we need uh, to have, for example, four tick boxes for, for each of the purposes for which we want to process data? Uh, the other matter regulated by the new draft is legitimate interest. So the legitimate interest is an area that uh, the GDPR expanded on and uh, really kind of uh, widened its scope to make it perhaps easier for businesses to, to have a, a lawful ground for processing. But uh, the Spanish approach uh, uh, decided to uh, list uh, the processing activities which will fall within legitimate interest and uh, is basically closing this category. So rather than leaving it open as was intended on GDPR, uh, under Spanish law, if, if this bill is passed, we will see a limited uh, amount of processing activities which will fall within legitimate interest. For special categories uh, of data, the GDPR allows member states to say that explicit consent of the data subject will not be enough to process certain special categories of personal data. And uh, unsurprisingly, the Spanish draft has <clears throat> decided to do exactly that. Uh, so basically they say that uh, consent, explicit consent is not enough, but it didn't go far enough. They didn't really specify which categories of uh, special categories of personal data will be covered. And, and there remains uncertainty as to uh, the application of this provision. Another surprising uh, solution or proposal is in relation to data portability where the Spanish draft contrary to the article 29 working parties recent opinion on data portability uh, the Spanish draft uh, says that data portability does not apply to any data inferred by the data controller from the data provided by the individual in terms of security, so rather than relying on the GDPR test which says that uh, controllers and processes have to adopt uh, 
measures which are appropriate to the risks of processing, the Spanish draft uh, includes certain categories of processing which are deemed high risk without specifying what kind of measures uh, should be adopted to uh, mitigate that risk. Uh, there are also some new mandatory DPO appointment requirements uh, across all industries including uh, telecoms, financial services, banking, insurance, uh, commercial research, healthcare, as well as professional bodies. Uh, there's a new express DPO duty which is to immediately inform the board of directors of any breach, of any security breach. So this again goes uh, beyond the scope of the GDPR. In terms of international transfers, the GDPR has removed any authorization requirements for transfers, yet the Spanish draft uh, imposes an authorization requirement where the, uh, where the transfer is carried out under amended model clauses or where the transfer is carried out by public sector bodies based on an international agreement. Uh, good news in terms of sanctions, the draft uh, defines an exhaustive list of minor, serious and very serious infringements. Uh, so this is the Spanish draft, but let's look at Germany, which has already passed its law uh, in May uh, this year. And the most interesting provisions are uh, in relation to applicability. So as we know, the GDPR, GDPR has extraterritorial applicability. So any business offering goods or services or monitoring uh, behavior of data sub subjects it, within the EU will be subject to the GDPR. The German draft goes further and it says that any processing carried out in Germany will be subject to German law. So even if, a, for example, a US business does not offer any services and does not monitor the behavior of Germans in Germany, but it uses a service provider for some type of processing, that will have to be subject to the German law. Uh, so that's uh, probably not as we were expecting it to be, and uh, this may actually discourage the use of German providers by all these non-EU uh, businesses. Uh, contrary to the Spanish draft, the German draft introduces uh, processing of special categories of personal data uh, that may be carried out without consent. Uh, for example, the assessment of the working capacity of an employee or uh, compliance with obligations under social security law. Uh, another interesting one is employee consent. So as we know, it's problematic to obtain consent from an employee because it's not deemed to be freely given. However, the German law uh, expressly says that uh, it can be considered freely given if uh, the consent is in relation to any provision of a legal or economic benefit, such as uh, a health, health management system or the use of companies' IT equipment. It will also be considered freely given if uh, the interest of the employer and the employee uh, are aligned, for example, uh, the example that was uh, stated in the draft is uh, circulating birthday lists and current photos of employees. Uh, in terms of sanctions, uh, Germany is introducing a new criminal sanction, uh, a prison sentence from two to three years in relation to any data, unauthorized data sharing. And lastly, I just want to mention Ireland because Ireland will be uh, uh, most likely uh, end up being the country where most countries will, uh, m most companies will set up their headquarters uh, in, in the near future. Um, and uh, Ireland is really focusing on achieving greater regulatory capacity as well as investigations and sanctions uh, in light of this perhaps new task. So it has published a draft bill with 95 heads and this will have to be now built out by the relevant departments over the uh, coming months. Uh, one uh, perhaps uh, good thing for all these businesses which are planning to move to Ireland is that san sanctions under GDPR will be subject to judicial oversight uh, 
So no fine will be imposed without the circuit court assessing the procedural rules and constitutional justice in relation to how the fine uh, is proposed to be imposed. And only if the circuit court issues a confirmation order uh, will the fine be actually imposed. Uh, so that's all from me on this topic. Uh, the next one is an update on CCTV and SARS. So I'll just start off on CCTV and then uh, hand over to Emma. So uh, the ICO has issued a new code of practice in relation to CCTV and this is really to address the changes in technology. Uh, cameras no longer just uh, record the image but they are now capable of all kinds of uh, things such as uh, automatic uh, face recognition. The code uh, specifically refers to uh, number plate recognition, body-worn video cameras uh, to drones and other systems that capture information of identifiable individuals or information relating to individuals. Uh, so the importance of this area is also highlighted by the uh, Protection of Freedoms Act 2012, which has introduced a new uh, surveillance camera code issued and uh, the appointment of the surveillance camera commissioner. So this POFA code will apply to public authorities only but it does set out 12 principles which the ICO code of practice draws on. So the ICO code of practice will apply to private companies uh, but it it states that it will also help uh, any organization to comply with the POFA code if, if required, if, if that company is a uh, public authority. Uh, so, as we know, domestic cameras are exempt, uh, uh, except where, where they capture images uh, which are beyond the borders of the private residence. Uh, in terms of the principles that apply to CCTV, uh, the code reiterates that uh, there must be a pressing need that uh, the CCTV is supposed to address. Uh, CCTV may only be used for legitimate purpose. The CCTV must be justified, necessary and effective and uh, no better solution should really exist to address the pressing need. Uh, the Operator should also assess the affected individual's uh, uh, expectation of privacy and the overall use of CCTV should be proportionate considering all these uh, elements. So a, a notice should also be provided, which is a very important uh, aspect. Uh, any data should be safeguarded. Data should not be uh, retained for longer than necessary and in relation to sharing of data, uh, this may be carried out only in, in pursuance of the purposes for which uh, CCTV was installed. Just a quick reference to the 12 guiding principles uh, from POFA which are relevant to the ICL code as well. So these relate to the governance and basically they require that there is a clear uh, responsibility and accountability for all surveillance camera systems. There are clear rules, policies and procedures in place which are communicated to all who need to know and who need to comply with them. Uh, operators of CCTV systems should consider any approved operational, technical and com competency standards and comply with them. And uh, there should be a regular review and audit mechanism with regular reports uh, to be published. Thanks, Alex. Okay, I'll just zip through quickly the um, ICO's updated subject access request guidance. And this was to reflect, reflect changes um, following recent case law. So the, the first um, significant change is the um, ICO softens its earlier stance and accepts the court's interpretation that when assessing what is a disproportionate effort, you can take into account the difficulties which occur throughout the process of complying with the request. Previously, the ICO felt the test of whether something was a disproportionate effort as applied specifically to supplying a physical copy of the personal data to the individual. 
The uh, slightly expanded exemption may assist with employee um, sales where there can be a huge volume of unstructured data, for instance, in emails, but the burden does remain high. The data controller will still need to show they have taken all reasonable steps to comply before saying that, they, that the further action is disproportionate in all the circumstances. Um, collateral purposes, the ICO refutes any assertion that that's a collateral purpose or ulterior motive on the part of the individual making the request can be used by the data controller to refuse to comply with that request. Most commonly this is the context of contemplated litigation, um, often again from a disgruntled employee. Um, and then legal professional privilege, just again the ICO clarifying that the exemption cannot be claimed simply because the information is requested in connection with actual or potential legal proceedings. The information itself must comprise confidential communication between a client and their professional legal advisor or its confidential communications between a client, their legal advisor or a third party where litigation is contemplated for an actual progress. And finally, um, the ICO specifically recognises that um, access requests can be made via social media and encourages data controllers to take reasonable and proportionate steps to respond effectively to these. And if you're a business that's concerned about this, um, steps to consider might be making sure that the people are wearing your digital marketing team or the team that are involved with the social media accounts know how to recognise an access request and have some training on how to escalate it to if necessary. Thank you. So just to finish off, um, I saw the other day that a, an SME, a small business, had been fined uh, for a breach. Um, it was a... Um, video download company. Uh, they uh, were hacked, cyber attacked, uh, and fined £60,000, which for many businesses is not a huge sum of money, but for a small business may well be. I've just cut and pasted what the enforcement manager said uh, in uh, reporting uh, this instance, which is a publicly available uh, report on the ICO's website. Basically, the the reason for the fine uh, was that, according to the investigation, the company had failed to carry out any regular penetrating testing, uh, had failed to ensure that the password for the WordPress section of its website was sufficiently strong, uh, had stored a whole load of unencrypted data um, which could have been encrypted, and the data that was encrypted uh, was not using strong encryption, um, and also the data that was on the server that was hacked was being held for longer than is reasonably necessary. So it's a pretty uh, damning uh, situation, but what I've put on the slide there is a reminder that it doesn't matter how big or small you are, there is an issue. And if you needed a wake-up call, uh, and I've talked about this before, we will get under GDPR a quasi-legal action, uh, and when it all goes wrong, I can see that we will end up with the regulator looking at fines, uh, with um, possibly uh, some really public undertaking, naming and shaming, damage to reputation, and then lawyers running along doing no win, no fee. Have you lost sleep? Have you been subject to emotional distress because all your data may be on the dark web? Come to us, no win, no fee. We will get you 5,000, 10,000, whatever it is, pounds, euros. And we've already seen at least one law firm in the UK doing exactly that already in anticipation of these types of class actions. Um, and the dam here is because of an old English case called Rylands versus Fletcher, where it's a tort of negligence that if you are responsible for keeping in something which if it gets out causes damage, then if you are not uh, if you do not take reasonable steps to keep it in, you will be strictly you will be strictly liable uh, for whatever happens. In other words, limitations of liability go out of the window, and it just uh, 
is a wake-up call, I think, that we must see that there will be more than a regulator looking at the 2% and 4%. It will be uh, like whiplash claims and personal injury claims, etc. So on that happy note, we come to two or three questions that we've just had before we finish. Uh, a quick one is, is direct marketing um, as regards legitimate interests akin to the soft opt-in? In other words, in terms of um, e-privacy marketing, can you rely on an existing contractual relationship as a soft opt-in rather than uh, opt-out? On the face of it, that's what it would appear that GDPR says, but we also have the challenge that the e-privacy regulation has conflicting approaches to this. So I'm not sure that it's a complete get-out-of-jail-free card. Somebody's also asked, how will legitimate interests apply outside the EU? Well, as I say, the um, Assistant Commissioner for Singapore came to visit us uh, two or three weeks ago because they are genuinely interested in the concept of legitimate interest within the Singapore regime. Um, and so I can anticipate that some jurisdictions in the world that are very uh, common law influenced might well look at this in the same light as our Irish and English commissioners are doing. And then the last one which is aimed at Emma was um, in terms of children's data, would a process that sells uh, to the adult uh, but allows certain collections of children's data in the course of that data collection still trigger these children's data rules. So Emma, what do you think? Uh, well, so yes and no. To the extent um, Article 8, which is aimed, which states that you need to have consent if a child is under 16 and and they the online service is being directed to them, whereas in this circumstance it doesn't seem as though it's being directed to the child, it's directed to the adult. Therefore, the Article 8 requirements wouldn't apply on the um, face of the facts. However, the other um, restrictions or safeguards that exist in relation to children's data would still apply to the extent it was being processed. Thank you. Seems clear. So thank you to everybody on the webinar today and particularly for the questions. Uh, I've already seen one or two people have emailed uh, regarding the some of the items I've said we can share with you, like the legitimate interest guidance. And as a reminder, please do get back to me if you wish to. Uh, if there's any one-to-one -one questions, by, by all means send them in and we can come back to you later. Uh, we haven't a webinar planned in the next month because of the uh, holiday break over here, but we will let you know as soon as we do have one, which I can tell you will be September the 12th, which we are doing with the Data Protection Network, where we're going to look at how things have progressed since now in terms of further work on version two. And that will be me and one or two other members of the drafting uh, group. So anybody interested in joining in on the work we're doing within the DPN also let me know. Uh, from all of us around the table, thank you, and we'll be with you on another occasion.